So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Kenny Asher from now the University of Irvine, UC Irvine, sorry, who's going to give a talk on the stability and the rational geometry of modular spaces of quartic K3 surfaces. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. So before I begin, let me just point out that this is all joint uh, with Kristen the Fleming. And uh, Yu Chen Liu. Okay, so yes, yeah, so I want to talk about uh, moduli of K3 surfaces um, and, and the birational geometry of moduli space. Um, but before I get to that, I'd like to just give some uh, motivation about the types of questions that we're going to be asking and why they're interesting and why one might expect them to be true. And so to do this, I want to uh, start off with a, a point of view of moduli of curves. So we have the moduli space of um, smooth, this moduli space of smooth genus G curves, and it has a natural compactification. Right, so here we have the lean Mumford compactification. All right, so this, this, um, introduces a stable curve, so nodal curves with finite automorphisms. And uh, so one very nice feature is that if you look at the complement, this here is, so I'm gonna denote this by delta, this is boundary divisor. And it has a nice um, sort of uh, inductive sort of structure. Um, and um, so one thing that has become uh, apparent in the, in the study of, of moduli is that it's often uh, worthwhile to understand not just one compactification, but actually several compactifications and uh, how those compactifications might be related, right? So for instance, maybe you're interested in calculating something on this moduli space and it's difficult, but you could relate this moduli space to some other compactification. You can calculate something there and then have some formulas to understand how, how they're related. And so one uh, particular incarnation of this is the hasid keel program. So I want to say a, a bit about this and give an example to sort of illustrate what's happening. So, so one can define, uh, in addition to just mg bar, mg alpha, so now some sort of family of compactification. So let's define this to be the proj of the, the canonical ring uh, um, Well, I look at the, the canonical bundle on mg bar, and then I add alpha times uh, Delta, where delta was his boundary divisor, and now I let alpha vary between zero and and one. Um, and so, essentially, I, I want to not just understand mg bar, but I want to understand all these these various compactifications as I let alpha vary between zero and one. So maybe let me include one here. Okay, and. Um, so I, I want to um, give you the example. So maybe before I give this example, let me just point out that there's sort of two general uh, cases where this is well understood and well studied. Um, so one, one case is when alpha is sort of large. So no matter what the genus is, if alpha is large, we sort of understand what's happening at, the, at that region. And then um, if the genus is particularly small and we sort of understand the whole picture. Um, and so one example I want to just give now is uh, the case of uh, genus three. And so this is from a, a paper of Hyun and Lee. Um, and well, okay, so we'll see in a moment why the genus three case is, is, are particularly, is particularly nice. So, um, so the first thing worth pointing out is that if you look at um, the case when alpha is equal to one, you just recover the standard delene Mumford compactification of um, M3. And then, okay, so I said that if alpha is particularly large, we understand what happens sort of more generally speaking. And so uh, it's always the case that once you go down to nine elevenths, you have this, this, uh, this contraction and this space here is actually isomorphic to a, a space that sort of exists in the literature previously. So this is the space of, um, Schubert's moduli space of uh, pseudo stable curves. So the idea here is that in M3 bar, you have curves with uh, elliptic tails, you contract the elliptic tails and you introduce cusps. And so, um, so maybe this is you know, 
not to compactification that you might be used to, but uh, you now have cusps in this compactification, and this is sort of standard happening no matter what the genus is uh, when alpha is, is 9 11. Um, and so I want to now jump to sort of the other range, and then we'll fill in the middle in a moment. So one thing that's particularly nice about the genus 3 case is that um, you can realize them as, as quartic plane curves. And so um, another natural sort of compactification that will appear here is the GIT uh, moduli space of quartic plane curves, right? So here I'm just looking at the space of cortex in uh, P2 and then quotienting by PGL3. So I have this space here, which I'm going to denote with a P just to uh, differentiate with the M because now um, this four here is the degree of the plane curve, no longer the genus of the curve. And so they show in their paper that this is isomorphic to M3 bar um, 17 over 28. And this is sort of the last space that appears as I, as I start varying um, alpha from one and then start decreasing. Okay, and now um, you could ask what happens now? What's the, what's the rest? What happens between 9 11 and uh, 17 over 28? And so there's this flip that happens between um, M3 bar 9 11 and M3 bar 7 over 10 minus epsilon. Um, and then the base of this flip here is M3 bar 7 over 10. And then finally, there's, um, there's a, uh, a divisorial contraction from M3 bar 7 over 10 minus epsilon to this GIT quotient. Okay, so we have this full picture here of what's happening for M3 bar as I run the hasid kiel program, right? As I run this log minimal model program on this moduli space. Um, and so it turns out that there's even more that one can say. It turns out that uh, these spaces that I didn't, um, you know, I just sort of these two spaces here that I, I wrote down, but didn't really say what they are. It turns out that these also have um, alternative uh, descriptions as, moduli spaces that sort of naturally appear. So for instance, you could realize these as certain uh, alternate GIT compactifications. So, okay, so okay, hopefully I get this right. I believe this one here is some GIT compactification of Chow stable curves. And this one um, is you take some uh, Hilbert scheme of bicanonical curves and uh, take the GIT quotient. So these spaces, all these spaces here have some alternative um, representation that's not just, you know, something that's coming from running the middle model program on MG bar, but actually running the middle model program uh, gives you these alternate compactifications that have nice geometric meaning. And in fact, there's even more one could say. Um, and so this case of genus three is really particularly nice. So, um, so the fact that I can think about these genus three curves as quartic plane curves allows me to um, say even more. And so I just want to say that there's sort of two other viewpoints that one can take here um, that will uh, come up again and again through this lecture. So I want to point them out now. Um, so the first one is sort of a stable pairs approach. So what I mean by this is, um, so I could take my quartic plane curve and I could um, embed it inside P2. And uh, I could put some coefficient here. So maybe now let me call it beta since I've uh, already used alpha. So now as long as, so if beta is, as long as beta is chosen so that this pair is log general type, then I could try to use the machinery of the middle model program or a stable pairs compactification approach to um, compactify moduli spaces of varieties of log general type. And so this was carried out by, um, okay, well, in the case of, uh, Cortex carried out by Hassett, but more generally carried out by hacking for all um, degree plane curves in there. So there's some compactification here coming from the mineral model program. Um, and so it turns out that this space here is isomorphic to this, this space constructing by uh, either well, Hassett or hacking in this case of, from the mineral model program. So we even see this stable pairs compactification appearing in um, running the Hassett Kiel program on this moduli space. And uh, one other uh, point of view that I think is uh, worth mentioning for the sake of today's talk is that you could also, well, if I let beta now be in the log Fano range, then I could use the, the theory of K moduli, which is now very well um, developed. Um, so if I, if I now, okay, so here beta is sort of large, 
Um, here, I'm going to consider the case where beta is sort of small. So here, I want I want to be in the log fauna region. So then um, it turns out that uh, so in in, in work with uh, Kristen and Yuchen, we proved that these moduli spaces have some wall crossing structure. So as I start varying beta uh, within the log fauna region, I have these well defined k moduli spaces, and they have a birational morphism between them that can be explicitly understood. And so it turns out that um, this part of this picture here can be realized uh, using this wall crossing framework for, for K moduli. So this is another way uh, to understand the right hand side of this diagram. And so yet again, we see that this hasid kill program is really uh, encapsulating all of these different uh, approaches to compactifying moduli spaces. Um, and so that's somehow going to be maybe a central theme of of today's talk. So, um, so now what I want to do is now that I've sort of introduced this Hasid kill program and shown that, you know, at least in this example, we see that the Hasid kill program shows us all these different compactifications. I now want to move on towards the case of K3 surfaces. Okay. So um, I just want to recall some basic theory of K3 surfaces and their moduli. So first, um, let's just recall that a, a K3 surface uh, is a complex surface. I'll call it S such that um, omega S is just the OS and um, H1 of S is zero. And so it's probably okay just to assume that the K3 surface is smooth and a little bit we'll ask that it has mild singularities, but um, not, so, not so important for right now. So it turns out that if you want to have a nice uh, well-behaved moduli problem, uh, it's not enough to just consider K3 surfaces, but instead you should consider a polarized K3 surfaces. So let me just, uh, remind uh, us what that means. So, so a polarized K3 surface. So these have a degree of degree 2D. So it turns out that they're always even. So, so the point is that the intersection uh, form it is a lattice and is an even lattice. So if I look at L squared for any line bundle, it's going to be even. So a polarized K3 surface of degree 2D is a pair. S comma L, uh, where S is a K3 and L is an ample line bundle with L squared equal to D. And we're going to be primarily interested in the case where L squared is two or four. So, um, so often in these sorts of problems, you could say more when the degree is, is small. And so we're going to start there. And so the moduli problem that we're going to be interested in, and so this moduli problem can be defined for uh, any polarized K3 surf, any polarized K3 of degree 2D, um, it's denoted F2D. And this is going to be the moduli space that corresponds to pairs S comma L, where S is a, is a K3. And maybe I'll say with ADE singularities, but um, I don't want to dwell on that. And uh, L squared equals 2D. And so this is the moduli problem that we that I want to consider. And so um, it turns out that if you use some Hodge theory and Torelli theorems and some lattice theory, so the H1 of a K3 determines its isomorphism class, the H1 is a lattice. And um, using all of this, you could prove that this space here is isomorphic to some 19 dimensional locally symmet uh, Hermitian symmetric space of type four. It's the quotient of, uh, uh, a symmetric domain by a, uh, a group. So let me just, I mean, somehow maybe the only really important part for today's talk is that this is about 19 uh, dimensional. Um, but naturally, just like with the moduli space of curves, the question that we want to ask is how we can compactify this space. And um, there's sort of two ways to answer this question. One is perhaps more theoretical. You know, what kind of 
compact vacations can I just construct for for this space, but maybe I can't say something so explicit about them. And then the other question we maybe want to ask is, you know, for small d, what could I say about the boundary of this space? Um, and so the first sort of natural compactification that one usually works with is the so-called belly Borel compactification. And so let me denote this compactification with an asterisk um, in the upper right-hand corner. So this is the belly Borel compactification. And so let me just make some comments about this compactification. Um, and so, so first of all, this compactification is somewhat canonical. So there's not really a choice involved. And this compactification, in fact, um, can be realized as, so there's a natural line bundle on uh, this moduli space, the Hodge line bundle. And if I take the proj of the canonical ring of the Hodge line bundle, this recovers the Bally Burrell compactification. Um, but somehow maybe the one problem with the Bally Burrell compactification, especially if you're coming from say the viewpoint of you know moduli space of curves, is that the boundary components have very high co-dimension. So when you compactify using Bally Burrell, you add points and curves. And so here we had a 19-dimensional um, moduli space and we're compactifying by adding points and curves. So the boundary components have a uh, very high co-dimension. So you add points and curves. Okay, okay so this is sort of what I wanna say about the Bally Burrell compactification. The important part is that it's sort of canonical. It always exists. It's this proj of this canonical ring. Um, and I just wanna point out that, you know, there are reasons why we would wanna look for other compactifications. Um, and so now let me also point out that there's, recent, there's been recent work of Alexeyev and Angle give another uh, approach to compactifying F2D using a uh, theory of stable pairs. So using this middle model type of um, approach. I mean, so somehow the, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, if I have a K3, then the canonical is trivial. So it doesn't immediately fit into the framework of the minimal model program or stable pairs. But um, so what you need to do is have a, uh, is have a divisor lying around, but you don't want to choose sort of any divisor. You want to choose a divisor that's somewhat intrinsic to the, to the K3 surface. And so they, they, they work out this, this sort of picture. Okay. Um, and so this is all very theoretical. These are just existence compactifications that exist, but maybe we want to say something uh, explicit. And so, um, to say something explicit, I want to uh, now focus on some low degree examples like uh, degree two and um, degree four. Okay, so I wanna focus now a bit on K3s of degree two because a lot of the sort of initial motivation comes from this case. And I think it's very illustrative to see what happens um, for degree two. Okay, so the starting point for K3 surfaces of degree two is that a K3, generically a K3 of degree two, this corresponds to a double cover of P2 uh, ramified along a sextic plane curve. Um, and so naturally, if I want to understand this moduli space here, a very natural way that would come to mind to give a compactification of this space, once I think about these K3s as double covers of P2 ramified along uh, sextic plane curves is to consider the moduli space, the GIT moduli space of, uh, of degree six uh, plane curves. So again, now I'm sort of switching notation. This no longer means genus, now this means degree. So this is uh, the GIT space of uh, uh, plane sex sticks. And so keeping in mind that this space here is um, taking into account the periods of the K3s, what I can do is I could take this, this GIT space here, I could take a, a curve that's parameterized, a sex stick plane curve parameterized by the space. I could take the double cover and then I could look at the cohomology of that K3 surface. 
And in that way, I get this birational map to this compactification. Um, uh, of the belly burrell compactification. Okay, and so now this leads to a sort of natural question is, um, is there a modular way to resolve this map phi? And so what I mean by this is there some moduli space or some family of moduli spaces I could put up here that will um, resolve this diagram and um, in, a, in some particularly nice way. Um, so before I answer this question, let me just sort of introduce some, uh, some terminology here. So there's a theorem of Mayer. And so for degree two K3s, so he understands the linear systems associated to, to K3 surfaces with, um, okay. And so for the degree two case, so, there's sort of two cases that could happen when you look at the linear system of a K3 of degree two. Either you have a hyperelliptic case, it's sort of the generic case here is where you have the double cover, or you have the, the other case, which is the Unigano case. And here, if you look at the free part of a linear system, this defines some elliptic vibration. And so, um, so now maybe now let me state the, the theorem. So this is due to Sha and Loyangha. And so, okay, let me maybe draw a diagram. So there exists a diagram. So here's the GIT space of um, the sextic plane curves. I have the belly burrell compactification, this rational map here. And then um, there exists this space, which I'll write in this way, that sits above um, these two compactifications and resolves this map. Okay, so now let me say a bit about what, what's actually happening here. Okay, so, so basically what's happening is that uh, if you look at the, so, by the theorem of Meyer, we have the hyperelliptic case, we have the unigonal case. All of the unigonal K3 surfaces are getting contracted to a point inside this GIT uh, moduli space. And so what Shah does is he blows up the point in this GIT moduli space. So it turns out that uh, a point on the boundary of this space parametrizes a triple conic. If you blow up the point that's corresponding to the triple conic, you can recover all of these unigonal K3 surfaces. Um, and then, uh, so let me, so this here is sort of, this is a blah, this is a partial Kirwan desingularization. So here you're blowing up this point that corresponds to the triple conic or the Ungano K3s. And then uh, what, and then, he, okay, so then he sort of shows that there's a set theoretic map from here to the belly Burrell compactification. But if you take then the, vo the viewpoint of Loenha, this can be realized here can be realized as a Q factorialization. So it turns out that there's a divisor um, inside here. It's the divisor of the, the unigonal K3s. This divisor is not uh, Q factorial. If you Q factorialize, you get this space here, um, this partial desingularization of the GIT quotient. So here, this can be viewed as the Q factorialization. Um, and so using maybe more modern terminology of weighing how this here is a semi-toric compactification. Um, right, so again, what's happening here is all the unigonal K3s are being contracted to a point. You, you blow up that point, and then this uh, is also at the same time the Q factorialization of the Bally burrell compactification. Um, okay, so this is what happens um, for, for degree two K3s. And so maybe let me make, um, some some remarks here. So first, um, I want to point out that a lot of this picture here can be realized uh, via K moduli, and again uh, K moduli and wall crossings. So we uh, discussed this a bit. So Kristen, uh, Yuchen, and I discussed this a bit in our 
a paper on wall crossing for K moduli. So if you, so the, again, the point is that I could view a sexted curve as a pair inside P2. And as long as the coefficient on the curve makes the pair log Fano, I have a K moduli space for that. And then I can understand what happens as I start varying the coefficients and you can recover this sort of picture here. Um, because for small coefficient, uh, you recover the GIT space and as you start increasing the coefficient, you'll um, obtain uh, this blow up here. Um, and then I just wanna point out that there's also approach via stable pairs again, where I could, um, and stable pairs as well as toroidal approach. And so this is a recent work of Alexei of Engel Thompson. So they give sort of another perspective on this story for uh, degree two K3. So stable pairs and toroidal compactifications. But uh, I don't have time to discuss that so much today. Okay, so, so the sort of the, the main point that I wanna make about this theorem for now is that, you know, I have these two very natural compactifications. There's a birational map between them and I wanted to understand if there was a modular way um, to resolve this map. And it turns out that there's a very nice way to resolve this map from the viewpoint of GIT. I just, I just uh, take the partial desingularization and then from the viewpoint of Hodge theory, I just take the Q factorialization. Um, but there's sort of a, a second approach that one can take when viewing this theorem. And so I want to uh, point that out now. So, so above, uh, I pointed out that uh, I could think about this Bailey Burrell compactification as the, the proj of the canonical ring of this Hodge line bundle. Um, and so it turns out, so. Um, uh, realization of Langha, which has now been pushed further by uh, Laza and O'Grady, is that actually the GIT quotient can also be realized as the proj of some canonical ring. So it turns out that, uh, so let's let, um, okay, so I, I didn't give the proper notation. So to let delta be uh, so a fractional multiple, okay, I don't want to dwell on this point, of uh, the, the divisor, the unigonal divisor inside uh, this uh, period space. So, so right, I said by Myers theorem, you have these two cases and you have a divisor corresponding to the unigonal uh, K3 surfaces. And if I take some fractional multiple of that, then the, the observation is that this GIT quotient can be realized as the proj of the canonical ring of uh, of lambda plus delta. And so now, now it leads to this natural question that was brought up by um, Laza and O'Grady, which they uh, named the hassett kiel loyenha program, which is to now put a coefficient in front of this delta and see what happens is I vary this coefficient from one to zero and in hopes that this will now interpolate uh, between the GIT quotient and the belly burrell compactification. So let me give some notation here. So, um, so pass it. So this is initiated in a series of papers by Laza and O'Grady. So the, the idea here is that I defined, so define uh, F two D alpha to be the proj of um, the canonical ring of lambda plus alpha delta. So of course the delta, the choice of delta is somehow going to depend on the choice of two D. Um, but the point is delta is always some geometrically meaningful um, divisor. Um, and now the question is, what happens is I vary this here from alpha from one to zero, and if you take this perspective, then you could reinterpret this above theorem as saying that uh, there's sort of just this one wall crossing that happens. So I go from you know, alpha equals one to alpha equals zero. And then in between, I obtain this, um, this uh, uh, desingularization, the Kirwan desingularization that was constructed by Shah. Okay. So can reinterpret. Degree two case uh, 
And so just like, uh, as we saw in the Hasid kill program for the moduli space of curves, we see here that this Hasid kill Lyanka program is going to capture all of these moduli spaces for degree two K3s. And so, um, so now let me sort of explicitly write down sort of what the questions now we want to ask are. So, so here's sort of the, the framework. So suppose that we have this belly Burrell compactification. And so I should point out that their, their predictions and this approach to interpolation is not just in their a program limited to the case of K3 surfaces, but any sort of moduli problem that behaves in a similar fashion to K3 surfaces where you have some type four um, domain. But for the sake of today, let's stick to K3. So suppose I have this Bailey Burrell compactifications and suppose that M is some other natural compactification, uh, usually a GIT compactification and actually today always a GIT compactification. So let's just say GIT compactification. And suppose there's a birational map Um, then there's a bunch of questions we would like to ask. So first, um, is there a modular way to resolve um, this map phi? Um, uh, second, can this modular resolution be realized via the hasid kiyo program? And then I mean, finally, suppose that you know, all of this does work out, that we can have a modular resolution and uh, it can be realized as this interpolation uh, question, is there a way to actually predict the walls and where this interpolation is happening? Okay, so I keep using this terminology walls, I just mean places where the moduli space changes. So somehow the idea is that is if I let alpha vary in some interval, alpha, you know, in some inside some interval, if I let alpha vary, then the moduli space is not going to change. But eventually I'm gonna hit some critical threshold where once alpha reaches that value, the moduli space undergoes some birational um, transformation. And so I'm asking if we could sort of predict where these these changes are are happening. And essentially the the work of Lazo Grady predicts, uh, they sort of conjecture that uh, the answer is yes. That uh, there is a modular, modular way to resolve. It can be realized via the hasid kiel program and actually they give some, some way to predict the walls using the, the lattice theory involved of the belly, the lattice theory involved with the belly burrell compactification. And so with this in mind, I want to take uh, as the goal to understand the case of quartic uh, K3 surfaces. Um, and so maybe let me just uh, point out. So just to give some maybe idea of what's going to be happening. So as we saw here, we, if we take the point of view of the belly Burrell side, then what's happening is first I Q factorialize and then I follow this Q factorization with some divisorial contraction. Um, so maybe this is a, a sort of very simplified case, but generally what's expected is that you always have this Q factorialization here in this first step. So remember the belly Burrell compactification is sort of um, the boundary is like super high co-dimension. Uh, there's always going to be this Q factorialization here. And then the final step is always going to be like this divisorial contraction. But uh, in general, in the middle, there should be some sort of series of flips perhaps that's happening as uh, there's more intricate um, birational geometry happening. But um, so we'll see that in a moment. 
Okay, so now I, I want to look at the case of quartic um, K3 surfaces. So, uh, so first thing I want to point out is that a generic quartic K3 surface can be realized as a quartic hypersurface in P3. And so then you can sort of uh, cast at what's going to happen is that you're going to consider the GIT moduli space of, of quartic hypersurfaces in P3, and you can relate that to F4 star, and then you can try to understand what's happening in between. Um, but before I do that, I want to understand a subcase that will eventually lead us um, to that case. And so now let me recall what Meyer has uh, classified for the case of quartic K3s. So again, you can look at the linear system associated to a quartic K3, and you could ask what the different possibilities are. So, so sort of generically, so now there's sort of this new uh, phenomenon that the generic case is no longer hyperelliptic. So that's what we saw in the degree two case. So now generically, you have just quartic hypersurface. So generically, you just have a quartic hypersurface in P3. Then we have the hyperelliptic case. So in the hyperelliptic case, uh, the linear system induces a two to one map onto a quadric surface in P3. So the generic case, the hyperliptic case, and then the unigonal case. And here, if you look at the unigonal case, then um, again, this is going to define some sort of elliptic vibration. So uh, what's happening is that you get a rational map from the K3 surface onto a twisted cubic inside P3, and then the, gener the general fiber is the elliptic curve. And then any quartic K3 belongs to one of these three classes. Um, So as you see, the, the complexity is increasing as we've gone from degree two to um, two degree four. Okay, so, um, so, th so there's a divisor inside. So okay, if I look at, um, so I look at F4 star here. So this is going to be the moduli space and the sort of compactification that I'm going to start with. But inside here, there's a divisor. So remember this space is 19 dimensional. There's an 18 dimensional moduli space that corresponds to the case of hyperelliptic quartic K3s. So let me for now denote this by um, the following. So this is divisor. Yeah, so oops, I already said divisor, and this is the moduli space. This is the be belly burrow compactification of moduli space of uh, hyperelliptic quartic K3s. So the generic, the general point of this moduli space is just a K3, which admits a double covered a, a P1 cross P1 that's ramified um, along a 4 4 curve. So, okay. And so, Taking this point of view, once I know that these surfaces are uh, double covers of P1 cross P1 ramified along a 4 4 curve, then uh, there's a natural GIT compactification of this space, right? So I could take the GIT space of all 4 4 curves on P1 cross P1 up to automorphism. So I could look at, uh, so let's see here. Okay, I'll call it like this. So this will be the GIT space of 4 4 curves. on P1 across P1. And then um, again, as I did in the previous case, we could take the double cover and then look at the Hodge theory of these K3 surfaces. And this will give me a, a, a map here from this GIT compactification to this belly burrow compactification. And I could try to understand now, uh, first of all, can I, find a modular uh, resolution and can I use, can I see if the Hasid q Lyonka program holds, right? Can I actually interpolate using this, um, this project of a canonical ring here? And so um, it turns out that this, the, 
right? So if you remember when I defined this uh, hasnik Loyenka program, I said that, uh, you know, there's this natural divisor delta that you need to find to interpolate. And it turns out that this divisor delta is going to be um, uh, K3s, which are double covers of the quadric con. So, so let delta correspond to K3s, which are double covers of quadric cone. Okay. And so it turns out that this is precisely the divisor where this map is uh, not regular. So if you remove this locus inside the belly Borel compactification, then uh, that's this is precisely where this uh, map is not regular. And it's also exactly where the space here is not uh, Q factorial. So just like in the case of degree two, we see all of these similarities. Um, and so I want to now state this theorem here. So this theorem is due to Laza and O'Grady. Um, so first of all, okay, so maybe if, to just put in words, we could say that the hasid kiel langha program holds. And so first of all, if I look at this space here where I interpolate, this is a projective variety. So the ring is actually finitely generated and interpolates between um, the GIT quotient. So this is when alpha is equal to one and the belly Borel compactification. So this is when alpha is equal to zero. Okay. Um, uh, second, uh, they find eight critical values. So these are, I mean, the values of alpha where something is changing. Um, and they're at these walls, there's a composition of uh, flips and divisorial contractions. So again, if you start from, okay, so maybe let me put it down in, in words here. Okay, so there are these, so let me slow down. So, uh, you, you know, we had this GIT compactification of four, four curves on P1 cross P1, and we had this belly Borel compactification. And uh, well, if you plug in alpha is zero, then you get the belly Borel compactification. If you plug in alpha is one, you get the GIT compactification. And then they show that as alpha varies, there's eight uh, critical places where something is changing. And at these, at these precise values, the moduli space is either undergoing a flip or a divisorial contraction. And so uh, if you start from uh, zero and you, you start increasing, then the first wall, so I mean like uh, here, if I go from uh, epsilon to zero, this here is a Q factorialization as expected. So the first wall is this Q factorization, and then I follow by a bunch of flips, and then I do a divisorial contraction down to the GIT quotient. And so actually, if, if you look at this space here, this gives uh, this, this space here. So this is a semi-toric compactification in the language of, um, in terminology of Loenja. And um, what's particularly nice about this space is that actually all the, the surfaces, the K3 surfaces parameterize the space have SLC singularity. So from the point of view of the de minimal model program, this is a particularly nice um, um, modular compactification. And so the, the way Laza and O'Grady uh, are able to verify the hasn kiel Loyenka program and prove these results is by using a VG, uh, variation of GIT of uh, two, four complete intersections. So if you take a two, four complete intersection, then this will give you this uh, hyperliptic uh, core to K3. And so they are able to run this, this huge variation of GIT to uh, interpolate between all of these uh, compactifications. Um, and so somehow this is a proof of concept that the hasik kiel program holds outside of this you know, degree two case, which was a bit uh, simpler. Um, okay, so I wanna make uh, some uh, comment about this, this theorem here. So, so it turns out that, um, well, so again, the, the point is that I'm looking at curves on site on P1 cross P1. And so I could look at pairs of, you know, these four, four curves on P1 cross P1. And I could ask that this pair is log Fano. 
right? Because if I require that this pair is log final, then again, I have a K moduli compactification. And so somehow there's this general framework. So, uh, um, so realized in, um, uh, so uh, my paper with Kristen Yuchen also uh, in the paper of um, uh, uh, Spotty, uh, sorry, um, uh, Gallardo, Martinez Garcia, and uh, Spotty that there's this uh, isomorphism when coefficient is very small between in, inside the like, hypersurface between um, uh, the K moduli space and the GIT compactification. So when this when the coefficient here is very small, we have this we expect that we should have some isomorphism with the GIT compactification. So then one could hope that as we increase C, so we've proven that there are these wall crossing morphisms on the level of K moduli, that perhaps we can actually uh, recover this uh, interpolation of uh, Laza and O'Grady. And so uh, we we do in fact prove this. So so this is uh, joined with uh, Kristen. And Yu Chen. Uh, so we proved that the wall crossings from K moduli um, coincide with the uh, coincide with the GIT uh, variation of GIT. In other words, the K moduli provides some natural framework to interpolate between the Bally Burrell compactification and the GIT quotient. So K moduli hyperlyptic quark decay threes um, interpolate between uh, GIT and uh, Bally Burrow. And one thing that's nice about this is it sort of uh, gives us a way to uh, predict uh, where these walls are located because we can understand the very quite explicitly um, what's happening from the point of view of K moduli. And so this suggests perhaps that if one wants to attack the case of quartic K3s, then uh, K moduli can be the right uh, or a, a solid approach to try to um, attack this problem. So let's uh, finish by, by discussing in the last minutes the, the case of uh, the full case of quartic K3s. Okay, so uh, for quartic K3, so we said generically, it's just a quartic hypersurface in P3. So there's a natural moduli space from GIT. So this is constructed by Sha, and this is a quartix in P3. So there's a GIT compactification. Um, and then there's the natural belly Burrell compactification. And uh, we wanna ask how these are related. Can we find a modular uh, desingularization of this map and uh, does it follow the Hasid Kiel Loyankov program? Okay. And so this map here is going to be regular away from two uh, loci. So one is the hyperelliptic loci I defined earlier, the place where we have the double covers of the quadric cone and then the closure of the uh, unigonal locus. So here delta is going to be some, this is going to be some delta is some. Um, some divisor corresponding to unigonal K3s and the uh, hyper elliptic locus from, from B4. And if you look at then this delta, this is precisely where this map is not regular. And so the point of view now that I want to take is that I could view a quartic hypersurface generically as just a um, there a quartic K3 is just a quartic hypersurface inside P3. And if C is sufficiently small, then this is a log final pair. And then once this is log final, we could use K moduli and we can vary the coefficient. And so, um, so we're able to prove using this uh, framework, uh, the following theorem. So. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, the K moduli space is and their wall crossings uh, interpolate 
between GIT and Valley Burrell. And so, as I, I pointed out, I mean, there's this general idea that if I have a hypersurface in the projective space, then the, the smallest sort of decay moduli space or the coefficient of the smallest should be isomorphic to the GIT. And that does hold in this case as expected. And then as you start increasing the coefficient, you start to see the interpolation between these two compactifications. And we make this explicit. So the wall crossings Um, are explicitly understood as a composition of um, two blow-ups and uh, seven flips. Um, and as one perhaps would expect from what we've seen above, the first step, so going from zero to epsilon, is a Q-factorialization of this divisor delta. And so, um, sort of just to put it uh, in words, finally, the hasta q a program holds. to K3s. And so what I mean by this is that one can define, okay, so actually we, we prove something slightly more general, but one can define this F for alpha and it's well defined for alpha between zero and one and it interpolates between the, the various compactifications. Okay, so just uh, to re you know, restate it, so what's happening is that we had these two, we had this core to K3s, we had these two compactifications and we show that um, using K moduli, since this, you're naturally able to obtain a log final pair here, you could apply the theory of K moduli. You could apply our theory of wall crossings to interpolate between the GIT compactification when the coefficient is very small, uh, all the way up to the Bally Burrell compactification as you start increasing the coefficient inside the log final range. Um, and using this, um, we're able to understand the wall crossings explicitly, show that this first step is this Q factorialization. Then we have these flips and the contractions. Um, and, and then finally, we are able to show that this uh, interpolation does follow the predictions of the hasid kieloy program. And so maybe just to give some, finish with some rough idea of how this works. So, okay, so we said that for small coefficient, we expect GIT to coincide with K moduli, and this does in fact happen. Then we used the classification uh, of the GIT of, of SHA to understand what we actually will need to replace as we start increasing the coefficient. And there's sort of two cases here. One is this so-called tangent developable surface. And then the other uh, locus is some eight dimensional locus inside the GIT that's well described by SHA. And so for the tangent developable, we just you know, use some explicit birational geometry to actually compute the stable replacement of that surface. And then for the eight dimensional locus, we uh, use our uh, paper on hyperelliptic quartic K3s um, and some uh, cone construction to turn these surface pairs into threefold pairs. And then we study the deformation of these threefold pairs to um, conclude this result. And finally, for the, to prove that the hasse kiel program holds, uh, we use the ampleness of the CM line bundle and relate that line bundle to um, uh, so then we relate the CM line bundle on the moduli spaces to the, the, the Hodge line bundle plus this delta that uh, Laws and O'Grady propose, and we just uh, uh, were able to prove this finite uh, generation statement. So, okay, so I, th I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll stop the recording for the question time.